Okay, so that's all the bandaging out of the way with. Now what we're going to go into, uh, the day before we did the recording for this video, I did a live on Instagram and we got some fantastic things of what people have come across on shoots and what we can do then to prevent or cure. So I think one of them was, the first one probably for me, with dew claws. Yeah, so I mean with any claw injury, the best thing you can do is know how to obviously bandage it, which we covered in the, in the bandaging aspect of things, but also know your dog's nails. So he's got black nails, really, really difficult to cut to make sure that they're nice and short. But ideally, you want to make sure these nails are nice and short before you shoot those. That's going to stop them catching and ripping and things like that. He's got dew claws. Again, we just make sure you file them nice, nice down or cut them down. Ideally, if you look at a dog's nail, if you put a bit of pressure on their pad, you see that nail come out a little bit? Can you yep. do that? Yeah. So what you want to make sure is that that, there's a nice flat line. So all of his nails are obviously nice and nice and cut. You want to make sure that as soon as you put your finger there and that comes out, that is not stabbing in, into, your, into your finger at all. Oh. So you've got a nice flat line basically from the nail coming out like that and you putting your finger on the pad, you want it to basically come out like that, sit like that, okay? And that's how to know where that quick is so you're not going to cut your dog and make them bleed when you're cutting their nails. But prevention for nail injuries, make sure your dogs are nice, again, road walks, get them filed down on the roads and stuff. Also get them used to just having their nails cut, having putting pressure on again. That's going to help you with your bandaging later on. If you're bandaging and including the foot, make sure you're putting little bits of that cotton wool or soft band in between the digits as well. And again, in between this bit and it stops the nails and the sweat getting building up in the pad as well when you're bandaging the foot up. Sweet. Okay. Uh, the most delicate part of a, of a dog. You can do a lot of damage taking something out of an eye that shouldn't have been removed, okay? So they're going to be one of the big things where you go, right, we bandage it, we do a big head bandage where this is all like nice and cold and compressed and we get them to a vet as soon as possible. Pulling thorns out is not a good idea. Unless they are in skin, which is around the eyelids here, unless they're in these little bits around here, yes, by all means, pull them out with a pair of tweezers. If you've got something in its eye, do not pull it out eyes very very delicate big pressure in your eyes as well anything that goes into that it's like pulling out a, a stake if you've got a stake into your arm you don't do it yeah. like you see that all the time on like casualty and things like that things go into arms and penetrate arms people don't pull them out until they're in the right place to pull them out okay so that everybody's prepared same with your eyes you can make a dog go blind very very quickly by pulling something out which shouldn't have been pulled out wait for a vet to do it so normal head bandage which you'll normal show in your head, courses? Yeah, normal head bandage which we do in the courses. So basically the stuff that we were using to cover, so that melanin um, swab, that sterile swab, soak that in just some normal water, normal bottled water, pop that over the eye like that and then you do your normal head bandage and that basically stops anything else being able to get into a trauma site of an eye. The head bandage goes over, you get into a bed and they sort it out. Um, probably different types of bleeds so that's a big one isn't it yeah i mean knowing your different types of bleeds helps you know which type of bandage to do as well yeah. um your arterial bleeds we're not really worried about the circulation you want to basically stop the circulation so the dog doesn't bleed out so imagine he's got a, an arterial bleed coming out of his leg here above the bleed you want to apply your tourniquet yeah. that's your um kind of bailing twine belt buckle belts anything literally your whistle lanyard anything you can wrap to tie around here and you want to literally tie it till you can't tie it any, yeah. anymore okay you want to prevent i would rather a dog amputated than another dog dead okay so you might cut circulation off but that's the whole point is that you cut it off so it doesn't bleed further and your bandage is a hell of a lot tighter than your normal pressure bandage on a vein wound. Well, th actually, just a quick question from me. Yeah. When I, when I did tourniquet and first field dressing training prior mm. on humans, we'd write a time. So on the issue of tourniquets, you'd have like a tab and you could write a time. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, kind of on a dog, but we'd write yeah. it on the forehead. Would you do the same? Yeah, I mean, I mean, ideally, you want to be telling your vet an accurate timeline of all injuries that's happened. So somebody else that may be watching, tell them to get the phone out onto their notes type it down, copy and paste it and text it to you so that you know exactly what's happened at what time, what's been done, what's been done, what's been given at what time to apply the dressing and all of that kind of stuff. Just so that you've got so much more, it's a stressful situation. A dog injury is stressful. The owner's going to be panicking. Best thing you can do is somebody take the owner away and calm it down. Somebody sort your dog out. Okay? Unless that owner is calm enough to do their own dog, which yep. some people are, some people stay very calm under pressure. And again, the whole point of these courses is that I teach you to stay calm. Yeah. You know exactly what you're doing, you're like, right, I can sort this, I can do, I can sort my own dog out. 
Okay. It goes into what I said earlier as well. It's not just, this, these videos aren't just aimed at your dog. These videos are aimed at everybody else's dog that you might be around on a shoot. So one of the one of the other questions on Instagram, and one thing that I want to know as well: what's the difference between an arterial bleed and a basic bleed? Okay. So your arterial bleed is um, it's where it's nicked an artery um, for a start, and what you've got is you basically um, you've got blood squirting out at the pace of the heartbeat. That's your big thing because go to an artery it's coming straight from your heart and out to your arteries and out to your, your peripheral arteries and that's where your dog can stuff. bleed out and that's where they can bleed out very very quickly from that's where you want to be ringing the vet and making sure that the vet's ready for an arterial bleed to arrive at the practice as well so they can get either a blood transfusion donor in or they can ring the pet blood bank and make sure that there's a blood transfusion waiting, waiting ready for them but that's your arter arterial bleed and that's where you need a tourniquet in place above the injury to make sure that it's stopping that circulation so that you don't bleed out from the injury and the blood's going to, the, to your other bits of vital organs. Again, your arteries are more likely to be where you get shock from as well in your arterial bleeds. The body can't cope with the loss of blood as quick as it's losing it. Um, your normal called venous bleeds, um, are, they're just the, the trickling of blood out. It can look very, very horrific. You can get a lot of blood from a vein bleed as well but it's not got that pressure coming out of that squirt. So if it's not squirting, don't apply a tourniquet? Basically, yeah. yeah. If it's not squirting, don't apply a tourniquet, but you still need your pressure bandage. Um, one of the other things, uh, so overheating. Yeah, I mean, you're overheating, you're more likely to get that, obviously, if you're on grouse and things like that, you start slightly earlier, you're in the August season. But again, it can be hot in September, October, even sometimes November time, you can get very, very mild winters now. So you're overheating, the best thing I can advise is that you don't cool them down too quick, okay? What's happening when they're overheating is all of your peripheral arteries are opening up, okay? So all of the all of the heat is on the surface of the skin and it's not in the main organs. Dogs so, don't sweat like we do, can they? They can't no, just sweat so through the they sweat through the feet, yeah. through the pads, and that's really the only place in the camp as well, so they lose their, their sweat through the mouth as well. So, but the best thing to do is to not cool them down too quickly. If you cool them down too quickly, what you actually do is you constrict all of the peripheral, so the outside. So if he was overheating and I put an ice pack all over his body, all I would be doing is taking all of that blood, all of those veins would constrict into his legs and stuff, and you would actually prevent blood flow to his extremities. So cooling too quick is a big, big problem, okay? So you want to cool very, very So, um... I've seen it on Facebook as well during the summer because it's not just it's not just for gun dogs it's for pets as well because yeah. you get that many different breeds that struggle to breathe essentially yeah, yeah, yeah. and heat up a lot quicker and people are giving them ice cubes and that was actually killing dogs wasn't it? Yeah so I mean an ice cube for a normal healthy normal temperature dog is, is usually not a problem normally what happens is is if you if you've got a dog that's very very hot and overheating you give them an ice cube it basically completely shocks the system so with a dog that's overheating you want to be giving them almost room temperature warmish water and getting colder as you go on and then you want to be doing active cooling from the outside as well so you want to be doing slightly damp towels but taking them off again you don't want to trap heat if you put a damp towel on a, on a hot dog it basically all it does is it traps the heat between the dog and the towel yeah so you just end up with the dog getting hotter and hotter and hotter because they've essentially got a blanket over them preventing the air. yeah preventing the, the heat getting out um, your cooling coats though, they are made of, of breathable material. So a wet cooling coat is a good thing for a dog. Again, not to, not to cool them down too quickly though. That's the, that's the main advice I can give is cool them down very slowly. Another thing to pack when you're going off on your, on your nice grouse days with your dog? Yeah, is a cool, yeah, a cooling jacket. Same with too cold as well. You don't want to heat them up too quickly again yeah. because what happens is if you heat them up too quickly, your arteries in your peripheral open up and take away all of the blood from your organs, your vital organs, and take them straight to your legs. Whereas you want your, your blood in your heart and your brain and all of that, that kind of stuff. Shut down. Exactly, so it causes them to shut down. So again, heat very slowly, okay? The, the one thing you want to do when your dog's shivering and shaking and stuff is go and wrap them up and put them right by Is that like eyes. hot eggs, you know, like for a person? Yeah, it's really like cold, children. You to... Yeah, it's like children oh, and horrible. stuff like that. But you can cause a bit of damage as well. So cool down quick, cool down slowly, heat up slowly. They're the, they're the two big tips. Um, again, after shoot days and things like that, um, I use these um, as well. So this basically gets them dry because that's a good thing as well. Is they get cold because they're wet. Um, so these get them dry and the, this comes off dry as well. So these work better than towels. Yeah. 
Um, these are hotter dog ones, you can get all sorts, rough and tumble, do them, equi fleece, these are a branch of equi fleece, but there's loads of places that do them now. Just make sure it's this towely, towely material that comes off dry as well as the dog being dry, so you don't just sit them in a cold, in a cold wet jacket. You actually introduced me to them, because I seen them towards the end of last season, I started getting yeah. one for Freya, and literally by the time you get home, your dog's dry. Yeah, and That was a mental dry, thing, yeah. Well, so and they're, they're, they're a lot happier, they come out, they look a bit silly, but... They really enjoy it to be fair, and yeah. they are really, really good from after it. But it's always, I found it was good to take two because yeah. you think about it when you're going back at 11s or you're going back at lunch. Yeah. All of a sudden, your dog goes from absolutely mental in anything from minus five to five degrees through the winter. Yeah. Could have been in war or anything. You go and chuck it in the back of a car, and it just goes cold, and it will just, it will just shiver up straight away. So having a nice dry one, have tech two, one to put on midday. Once put on at the end of the day because you don't want to be putting a damp one back on your dog so I've got two now as well and again make sure you've just got the appropriate bedding in the back of your truck as well um, some people use straw because obviously that just makes a little nest for nice them and, and nice absorbent um, vet bed's another good one as well that just absorbs straight away it's a bit like this kind of material um, but I know rough and tumble do blankets in this material as well yeah. so you can have them in the back of your car they also do nice mitts as well that go right over your hands so you can dry your dog self as well um, and things like that what I'll make sure to do as well I'll put a couple of links to descriptions on, uh, on uh, the info part on the video so that you've got a link to try and find them because they are absolutely fantastic they really really benefit your dog if you can get a couple of them in they're great um, so but again I mean prevention again is is beneficial as well the, the whole idea of first aid is not just to tell you what happens what you what to do when you get into a crisis but it's also to make sure that you know what to do to prevent one happening in the first place you were saying knowing your ground knowing the ground that's another one training your dog like if your dog does not have a stop whistle how the hell are you going to stop them jumping a barbed wire fence or Run into a road. running into a road anything like that yeah. you need to be able to stop your dog even if they are on a retrieve chasing game anything like that chasing a runner all of that kind of stuff they need to be able to come off of that if there's a danger that's potentially going to go in front of that in front of that retrieve so good training know your ground have your first aid kit that's prep as well but also again if you know your dog if you're going duck fighting and you know it's very very cold and it's early in the morning or late in the afternoon these again fab things so these are neoprene i don't work my dogs in bushes in these so this is literally just for picking up in and what happens is, is it goes over the dog like a little vest um so it opens up here i put the feet through there this bit goes on the chest this bit goes over the back and does up um like that with then a zip goes all the way down this basically they then sit with me in in a hide anything like that where they're going to just basically keep warm while we're sitting and waiting and not doing anything but also it keeps their main core of their body dry when they're swimming as well. It acts like a wetsuit. It is, it's basically, yeah, if you feel it, it's like a yeah, neoprene wetsuit. Yeah, so um, fab for your white spaniels creates as well. That, creates creates that heat. So any, yeah, water, any water that does get into it gets heated by the body, the same as a wetsuit would do. And then that water then keeps the dog warm essentially, don't it? So exactly. It's, but it also, again, in the camo colour, is good for your for your white spaniels as well. Yeah, because you keeps, uh, yeah, because yeah, I mean, my, my spaniels are white and, and they're very very obvious to that. What was the um, what's it as well? So this, these the are made tail, by these the are tail. made by Jack Pike as well. Yeah, Jack Pike make them. What was the Labradors with a stick cold tail? So swimmer's tail again. Um, so that's basically like cramp of their tail really, but it stems from their whole body being cold when they're swimming. So you can prevent swimmer's tail by a swimming them constantly get them used to it so don't just go right season started i'm going to jump them in the water and see what happens make sure they're regularly swimming all the way through the summer so as the water gets colder they get used to it so you don't just go and put them in at minus five water temperatures and things like that everything that we're obviously everything that we're talking about now as well a lot, a lot of big parts of it is do it before the season yeah. start before don't get to september and think shit i've got to train my dog because you've got to build up that level of fitness Everyone knows the best dogs on a sheep are the fittest dogs are the ones that are the most controllable and they're the ones that are less likely to come out with injuries. Yeah, so I mean you're dogging in fab for that, like you want to yeah. be that you're working the big boundaries of the shoot, so you're working the, the bigger, bigger areas of the shoe. Um, road walking as well, builds up your stamina, wears down the nails, sorts out your feet as well, gets the nail the pads hardened up. So all of those little things you can start doing as, as a prevention so that when you get to a shoot day your dog is at its best physical peak fitness um, and ready ready for the day so that you prevent these injuries happening rather than trying to fix them. I mean, we can't avoid, obviously, them going into a hedge and coming out with cuts and things like that. So, But you can prevent the things like your pads being soft and your tail swimming, all of that kind of stuff. Um, 
Another thing we touched on is your blood glucose and feeding dogs on shoot days and all that. Yes, this was one because I, 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 I am terrible for it. I give Freya a, not loads, but like, I might have like you know like them Caesar little packet things or something. Nice little mm. treat at lunch. Like we're going for our lunch. Thing. Why can't you don't have their lunch? Yeah, before? and I mean normally most most dogs would be absolutely fine eating that close after exercise but there's always the risk of both um, which is basically the stomach expanding very quickly because the whole system the whole body system is working very quickly because they're exercising um, but also bigger dogs with deeper chests as well are more likely to get low more twisted stomachs as well from eating very quickly after after exercise so pointers fizzlers all of those kind of breeds um, you want to make sure that all of your, your deep chested dogs are not eating very very close after exercise and things like that. So ideally, again we talk about prevention, make sure your dog is physically fit and on a good diet and has a good meal in the morning and in the evening and you shouldn't need to feed them on a shoot day, ideally. I mean most dogs will be, will be fine, um, so I'm not saying now stop everybody feeding your dogs on shoot days, but just to be aware of the things you could potentially cause if you, feed, if you feed your dog on a shoot and they're not, their, their stomach's working overdrive because they're, they're exercising and their the whole body's not busy. So if you're someone that likes to feed their dog on a shoot day, uh, on like in the middle of shoot days, what would you do? I mean, I personally don't feed my dogs. They get their meat, they get their meal in the morning and they get their meal in the afternoon well after we're back. Because you actually got me giving them a bit extra. So like I was saying yesterday on the yeah. Instagram live feed, for I guess a couple of eggs with a, a normal food, so she gets yeah. normal food, a couple of eggs on top of that. And then in the evening when she comes in, it's absolutely knackered and I noticed this really yeah. helped her recovery mm. was a tin of tuna. Yeah, or so tripe, anything like that. Tripe, raw chicken wings, all of that kind of stuff. But ideally, if your dog's on a good enough food and is a good enough physical weight before you go on your shoot days, your dog should be fine and okay to, to last the whole day the whole day working. Um, I personally don't feed mine at all on a shoot day. Um, I just don't want to risk it. I don't have deep chested breeds. I've got Labradors and, and, Spit and Springers. But why take the risk, in my opinion? Um, but I know lots of people that have been feeding dogs on shoot days for, for absolute years and have never had a problem. So I'm not I'm not going against what anybody else is doing with their dog, but I'm just putting it out there, the risks that can be associated with, with feeding a dog out on a shoot day. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Well, I suppose, on that note... Last thing I wanna cover, sorry, oh, go on then. very quickly. Go on then. Um, so, low blood glucose as well can cause dogs to seizure, okay? Right. So seizures, I have seen a dog seizure on shoot day. Um, I've seen a dog so seizure. it's either through collapse and exhaustion and lack of oxygen because they physically can't breathe quick enough for their for their body, or low blood glucose again can cause can cause their seizure activity as well. So because you don't know why your dog is seizuring, you, you're not an MRI machine, you can't figure it out. The best thing to do is make sure do not restrain your dog, do not physically hold them down while they're seizuring. Best thing to do is grab everybody's coats, everybody take the coats off lie the coats down, put the dog on the coat so he's not going to hurt himself anymore. Remove any logs, rocks, anything like that away from the area. And as horrible and as brutal as this sounds, somebody timing it and somebody videoing it until that dog comes out of its seizure. When it comes out of its seizure, wrap it up, keep it nice and, and cool but warm at the same time because they use a lot of energy to seizure so they tend to be very hot. So make sure it's, if, it's cool, if it's hot then keep it cool, active cooling again which we mentioned. Or if it's too cold, make sure that it's got a nice warm and get it straight to the vet with that video. So the vet can see the video and they can tell a hell of a lot from a video of a dog seizuring. So that is the best thing you can do for your dog when it's seizuring. Do not try and pull it out of it or, or, or restrain it in that, in that seizure episode. I, I can remember years ago when I was in a Labrador seizure. Yeah. And, and it, was, it wasn't even on a shoot day. We'd literally just turned up and opened the doors. Come on, mate. Come out. Bang, went in and he and he, we were like, oh, and we all, your, your immediate reaction is to go, let me help this dog. And he was like, no, stay back. Because he, he was saying as well, I don't know if you agree with this, but the dog doesn't necessarily know where it is at that point. No, exactly. So, so it really could just by, by accident, yeah. it doesn't mean to, it's not nasty, but the dog's as scared as, as you are in that situation. But the, best, the best thing to do with a seizure, because you don't know whether that is actually just, it's an epilepsy or it is actually something that's happened on that shoot day, you don't know why that dog's seizure is. So the best thing to do is stay calm, get a video of it, yeah. get a timing of it, um, and then just make sure that when that dog does come round nice and calmly, um, if you're in an area and you can move it to a shaded area to prevent any light and stuff like that, they come out of seizures a lot quicker in a darker environment. So if you can get it into into anywhere like that, but make sure it's got enough space to properly seizure around because they do move a lot when they're seizuring. 
and the best thing you want to be able to do is make sure that that area around that dog is nice and safe for it but get get that video because the vets will, will use that video to help diagnose yeah yeah so i suppose main things to take from these videos is prevention is better than a cure yeah. make sure you've always got the right equipment and make sure you get your ass down to come and see Emma at Cuddy Shot Gun Dogs to come and do the course because I'm going to be doing it as well. I, I, this is the first that I've had it. I, I've absolutely loved the inside. Thank you so much. Right. I really, really enjoy I, I love all kinds of stuff like this. And being ready for your days and ensuring that you can help your dog, you can help somebody else's dog. It's really, really important. And I think we take our dogs for granted sometimes. And, and when the worst happens, not knowing what to do or if you've... If you train for the situation, you'll deal with a situation a hell of a lot better. Won't you? Exactly, um, and you'll help anybody else out that hasn't been able to get to a, to a first aid course or a gun dog first aid course. This one is specifically aimed at, at gun dog owners um, that are working them on a few days. It's, it's different to my pet course that I run as well. It's, it's field injuries and being prepared for field injuries and how to prevent field injuries as much as you possibly can from happening. Um, the course is twenty pounds. You get uh, handouts from the day that we do. Um, you can make your own notes. We do a bit of quiz at the end, um, and then you will go away with a tiny mini first aid kit. Um, we cover a hell of a lot more of the bandages, and we've got two of our dogs there all the time for you to actually practice on. Them. So we've shown you how to do them. You then also practice on the dogs as well. Yeah, that is absolutely fantastic. I'm looking forward to the course. I'll definitely be getting some Instagram photos, maybe a couple of Instagram lives where the course actually going on. Yeah. Really, really looking forward to it. Emma, once again. Thank you very much. No problem. All the links will be in the description. We've got all sorts coming up with Hunting, Shooting and Tom. We're back down with Dan. We're doing some more stuff with Emma. We're going to be catching up throughout the season, hopefully doing some picking up. So make sure, like and subscribe, hit that bell. Also, if you haven't got a YouTube account, which I know a lot of people have, you haven't got one, have you? I do you now. I do you now. Haven't, yeah, no, so she does now. now. I do now. I do it now. is <laughs> as easy as signing up to Facebook, guys. Go on there, email, password, job done. You'll be able to subscribe to hopefully you think Hunting Shooting Tom's a wonderful channel and you'll be able to subscribe to, describe subscribe subscribe to lots of other channels that you will find on YouTube that are absolutely relevant all your field sports printers your shooting shows all different stuff like that so you can fill your afternoons with relevant content instead of watching crap like EastEnders yeah so get yourselves on YouTube get yourself likes and subscribe links to Instagram will be on the bottom for both mine and Emma's also our Facebook pages also other youtube stuff and everything that we're doing just keep searching keep looking everything will be uh having a description of everything that we've got here today in the first in the first aid kit you'll be able to find them from your vets i'm sure there's lots of websites and stuff yeah there's loads that. of websites i mean all of my stuff i bought online so it all came from like a vetco solutions kind of uh vet solutions website where you can get it all but if you just type in uh first aid kit most human yeah. first aid kits are very similar to the, to the dog first aid kits as well yeah so remembering about that, and we'll also put the links into things like the Hotter Dogs, and we'll also have a link straight to the Facebook page to the event for Emma for the dog training and the first first aid course. Yeah. So look, guys, thank you very much for watching. I know it's been a bit long-winded, but I hope there's enough information in there for you to take your dog into the season. I hope that everybody watching this video that works dogs has absolutely fantastic time over the next season. It's going to be absolutely amazing, guys. See you soon.